Hey everybody, this is the Holy Hand Grenade. Welcome to the show. I'm taking every thought captive, we assault the boundaries of reality in this quantum game of hide and seek. It's a new perspective of Earth from Earth. This is the Reality Distortion Effect on Take on the World TV. You know, the great Jim Garrison, the attorney uh, that was portrayed by Kevin Costner uh, in the 1992 movie JFK once said, and what I'm about to say, this is nothing personal against the two Scientologists who have contacted you. And let me say this again, this is not anything toward those two Scientologists. Uh, But Jim Garrison once said, and my father told me this uh, many years ago, uh, what else do you expect from a pig other than the grunt? (laughs) And of course they're going to defend it because if they ever admit, Jason, that they were wrong, you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. So people would rather perpetuate a lie than to expose the truth. And in this uh, part eight of this, what we call uh, this eugenics uh, program, this eugenics series entitled Scientology, the Third Open War of Deception. Again, Scientology, the Third Open War of Deception. We got some new uh, listeners um, from the GSRR radio site, from our side, who are listening and just want to go through a quick, a, a quick uh, rehabs of what we talked about last week concerning uh, the boule. Uh, now, yes. the, nation, uh, the Nation of Islam with Louis Farrakhan um, being a part of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, which is the Boulay Secret Society, including Dick Gregory, Alpha Phi Alpha, Dr. Charles H. Wesley, his book, The History of Sigma Pi Phi or Boulay, on page 146, he talks about the Divine Nine uh, of the National Pan Hellenic Council of the Nine Black Greek Lettered. Uh, Secret Society fraternities, okay, uh, who are also Prince Hall Masons. That's a great picture there that you're showing there, uh, Jason. Now, remember, every uh, black boule is a 33rd degree Mason, but no black person can ever attain a 33rd and one half degree. Hmm. Only non black persons. That's another topic for another day. So the boule. They are the gatekeepers. They are the advisors to the system of the global uh, Luciferian system. Um, Now, remember, we talked about the historical knights of the round table um, from anywhere from nine nights up until really as high as 150. But the 13 Illuminati families that control 99 percent of the world's wealth. You're talking about the Rockefellers, the Oppenheimers, the Warburgs. Um, We're talking about the Rothschilds. Okay, Um, Mm -hmm. we're talking about. DuPonts, uh, the Vanderbilts that you may mention on last week. So the nine nights of the uh, Illuminati round table are protected, uh, Jason, by the nine Greek letter Black Seeker Society um, fraternities. Okay. And so we're talking about Omega Psi Phi. We're talking about Alpha Phi Alpha. And so those of you, you can always uh, click on uh, the Divine Nine of the black Greek letter uh, seeker societies that really actually was started with also uh, with Rothschild money uh, as well uh, as Rockefeller money. Many uh, of the uh, financial backing to that began the Boule Seeker Society in the nine Greek letter black seeker societies was through the Rockefeller Foundation, another topic for another day. So each uh, night of the round table, who owns the table are protected by each of the nine Prince Hall, nine Greek letter black seeker societies. So that's on page 146 of Dr. Charles Wesley's book, The History of Sigma Pi Phi, where he talks about through the history of Sigma Pi Phi, that the divine nine of the uh, Pan Hellenic Council are not the owners of the table, Jason but they are the protectors of the table. They don't own the crab barrel. 
They are, ju they are just the overseers of the crab barrel whose design is to keep the black masses here in America in check. And as you mentioned that, Bishop, I'm reminded that during our very first interview, you spoke about the crab barrel. It's interesting, the history of Sigma Pi Phi is one of these books that Amazon or someone has determined is $129 to purchase, which seems like a lot. I never get that because to me, if there's that much demand for the book, wow, here it's up to $900. It just seems... Um, if there were that much demand, why not just reprint it or put it on Kindle or something like that? I always feel like they're doing this to prevent more people from reading the book. And Great question. Hmm. But the boule but the boules are the caretakers, care take, care caretakers of the, not just the 99%, they are the caretakers of the 1%. And the 1% is the masses, not just of Black America. They are the caretakers of the global 1% as well. So as we talked about last week, uh, Jason, concerning uh, this third opium war of deception concerning Scientology, uh, the boule is, is a Greek word uh, signifying they are the protectors. They are the advisors to the king. And so the Nation of Islam, via through Louis Farrakhan, has been assigned by the deep state not just to join the Church of Scientology, but to protect it. And I'm going to talk about that here in the next few minutes. So the boule, the term boule, uh, represents the lower level, the, the lowest level of the Greek parliament today. And that term boule also can be interpreted into the word boulea, capital B-O-U-L-A-I, which means they are the protectors. OK, and matter of fact, during the Greek Hellenistic era of Aristotle, Plato and Socrates, Jason, boules were not elected. Boules were selected. Come on, Barack Obama. Barack Obama was not elected. Barack Obama was selected through a Greek word, what we call sortition, capital S-O-R-T-I-T-I-O-N, which means selected. So Barack Obama, maybe we can get into a series concerning his background. He was not elected. He was selected. So Jesse Jackson is selected, okay? Uh, LeBron James is selected. Kobe Bryant is selected. Reverend Al Vitamin B Deficient Sharpton is selected. <laughs> Uh, these black men and women, Ofer Winfrey, who is a witch, all of them, Jason, uh, and the reason why I say Ofer Winfrey is, is a witch, he is a proponent, a worshiper of the goddess, not just of the goddess Diana, uh, mm. a concern of Dianetics, Dianism. We talked about that last week. But Ofer Winfrey is a proponent of the religion called Gaia, capital G-A-I-A. Uh, concerning the doctrine of the goddess Gaia, that you as the individual are your own god. Another hmm. topic for another day. All of these talk about aliens quite a bit, don't they, Gaia? Or am I confusing that with something else? They talk about aliens as well. And, you know, it's interesting that you should bring up the term aliens, you know, and we're going to be bringing up the term Stargate. Mm -hmm. That is Connection to the church and Scientology. This is deep. You see, the, the, the Scientologists who are listening, they have never heard of this type of impartation of teaching before. Because the higher echelons of power, Jason, within Scientology, they're not teaching the people this. Because if the people knew the truth, the truth, the totality of the truth, they would leave Scientology today. But yes, getting back to your statement. Uh, Gaia is connected to, uh, then we're talking about uh, UFOs and Area 51 and, and yeah. aliens. And so, absolutely. So when we talk about the term boule, uh, we also talked about back in June, the term archon, right? Capital A-R-C-H-O-N. Uh, the, the archons are the, uh, every black male is a archon, uh, in the Boulay Seeker Society, the women are called the Archeus. 
the Latin Vulgate expression for archon is demon, and Arceus is demoness, okay? And so the there's another term from archon, um, that is the term abraxis, and allow me to spell that, oh. capital A-B-R-A-X-A-S. So abraxis means great archon. So that term abraxis, uh, Jason, is condensed into the term what we call abracadabra. I oh. kid you. So the term uh, boule, archon, abraxis, okay, abraxia or abracadabra is also uh, the logo that's on the Starbucks coffee cup, okay? Uh, that was one of the gods that Alistair Crawley had incorporated into the secret of the temple, which also Jack Parsons incorporated, which also L. Ron Hubbard incorporated. So then when we talk about the boulets, okay, the archons, abraxis, abraxia, or demon, or abracadabra. So the boulets, Jason, are never elected. They are selected not through a vote, but they're selected through uh, the bloodline. And that's, a, that's another topic for another day. So when we talk about Scientology, the third opium war of deception, uh, remember in 1941, we talked about this last week. There was a Boulay convention uh, in Los Angeles, California at the Greek Amphitheater at Griffith Park. Park. Now, the term Griffin is the acronym for the term Griffith Park. And Griffith Park uh, was the location uh, that composed of 3,000 acres that was donated to the city of Los Angeles prior to 1940 by a man by the name of uh, Griffith, J. Griffith. Okay. Another topic for another day. His first and name so, was Griffith as well? Yes. Yes. Uh, Griffith, weird. J. Griffith. Yes. And, and you know what's so interesting, uh, Jason, um, just given kind of a, a rehasp, going back to the foundation, just in case some of those uh, who are listening today were not privy to this teaching last week. Uh, Dr. Emmett Scott oversaw the 1941 Boule Convention in Los Angeles uh, at the Greek Amphitheater. Notice that Greek Amphitheater uh, at Griffith Park. So then, um, there was another man that I just found out yesterday through my research, Jason, that was located uh, at this 1941 convention. His name was Dr. Robert R. Moton, capital M-O-T-O-N. Oh, that's interesting. Who is Who was Dr. Robert R. Moton? He was the second president of Tuskegee University. So then Dr. Emmett Scott, and Dr. Robert R. Moulton were both high-ranking boulets, Jason, who were working covertly with President Woodrow Wilson from 1913 hmm. to 1921 to create the syphilis conspiracy in which Booker T. Washington, who used to be a boulet, but he left the Boulay Secret Society a month before his death in 1915. So then Booker T. Washington dies uh, of complications uh, that came from syphilis. Interesting. Uh, another topic for another day. So then, as we move forward here, so then there's a book called Tuskegee's Truths, Rethinking the Tuskegee Syphilis Conspiracy. Again, Tuskegee's uh, Truths, Rethinking the Tuskegee Syphilis Conspiracy. And it said there in page 361, Jason, and I quote, that Julius Rosenwald and his $5 million, which he donated to Dr. Robert R. Moulton and Dr. Emma Smith. And by the way, to African-Americans who know about Dr. R., uh, Robert R. Moulton, Dr. Moulton, OK, was one of the boulets who took down uh, doctors, Dr. Marcus Mosiah Garvey. You and I talked about Dr. Garvey back in June. So on page 361 of the Tuskegee Truths, Rethinking the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, um, Ro uh, Julius Rosenwald, through the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, 
uh, gave millions of dollars, Jason, to Dr. Emmett Scott and Dr. Robert R. Moulton to begin the syphilis conspiracy as early as 1916, which did not become uh, enacted until 1932. Also through the Rockefeller Foundation supported the syphilis conspiracy from 1932 to 1972. So what I'm doing, Jason, is kind of rebuilding this foundation again uh, concerning Scientology uh, being the third open war of deception and how Scientology has now crept into Black America. And there is a Scientology center and church here in Harlem, New York. I'm going to bring that up later on if I had time. So quickly here, uh, to all of you, uh, your listeners, uh, Jason, if you get a chance, look up uh, a Georgia state senator by the name of Donzella James, capital D-O-N-Z-E-E-L-L-A. Donzella James, on the 19th of January, 2020, um, the state of Georgia, uh, through Lieutenant, through the Lieutenant Governor, Jeff Duncan, capital G-O, oh, capital G-E-O-F-F, Duncan, appointed Donzella James to be a part of a 24-member commission, Jason, to remove federal oversight of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association in Washington, D.C. In other words, Donzella James, who is not only a boule in Atlanta, Georgia, but she's also a Scientologist, huh. was put on the board of this 24-member commission by Georgia's Lieutenant Governor, Jeb Duncan, uh, in order to, to oversee the mental health system of the state of Georgia. In other words, like I said last week, uh, Jason, uh, L. Ron Hubbard was totally against the DSM-5, the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, uh, edition uh, level five, five, of the American Psychological and Psychiatric Association, but yet L. Ron Hubbard, uh, a month before he died, he suffered a stroke, and I'm gonna talk about that here in the next few minutes, and L. Ron Hubbard uh, was injected with a anti-psychotic drug, but yet he was against the American Psychological and Psychiatric Association. So as we move forward, I just wanted to relay that foundation just for those who were not privy to last week's teaching, that the Boulé Secret Society is not beloved by the Church of Scientology, but they are being used as pawns, as political and social pawns to perpetuate Scientology into Black America. Now let's get into Dianetics. We talked about that last week. The term dire is a Greek word through mine. So Dianetics, all right, uh, is rooted in what we call psychosomatic cleansing or what they call clearing. So the term, another term for clearing, Jason, is the term clairvoyance. Now, within the religion of Jainism, they teach uh, um, the occult teaching called Dianism, okay? Uh, which is rooted in the Dianic cult uh, of what we call sexual initiation, okay? And in Ronald D. Wolf, uh, who was the estranged son of L. Ron Hubbard, said under oath before his death that through the E-meter, Jason, the auditor or the modifier would always ask the candidate the question concerning, concerning his or her sexual past. So they would build a database concerning that person's sexual past. That is Dianetics. That is Dianism. That is part of the Dianic cult, which goes back to the 1800s. Now, the term uh, Dianetic is interpreted through the Sanskrit of the word Dharana, capital D H A. R-A-N-A, -A, which means the self is God. The individual is God. So Dharana 
the acronym for Dharana is the term DHRI, capital T-H-R-I with the H silent, which means clearing, clairvoyance, Dianetics. You and I talked about Bonnie Matheson on last week. He was the creator of the E-meter in 1951. And so then in 1989, I just found out. Sorry, recently, Bishop, before you move off of all that Diana stuff, I just want to remind everybody about this woman, Diana Doors, who was married to Richard Dawson and is closely associated with the uh, Bob Kramer sex scandals. He was the star of uh, Hogan's Heroes, who was well known for having these sex parties and recording them. Diana Doors was, you know, sort of a model, actress, sex symbol in the 50s and 60s. I don't know if you know this, Bishop, but obviously you're probably familiar with the Beatles and the cover of their famous yeah. album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I think a lot of people mistakenly took this image here to be um, Marilyn Monroe. This is Diana Doors pictured on the cover of the Beatles album. Wow, I did not know that. Uh, Jay, excellent, excellent research on that. And again, every time you do it, every time, Jason, you always hit a nerve with me that <laughs> opens doors that I normally would not go into. Excellent research. And that, that's why you're a great host. Uh, it's interesting as we dissect and unpack this Scientology uh, even more to another level for your listeners. In 1989, former CIA officer <laughs> uh, Miles Copeland uh, wrote in his memoirs entitled the game player, occultism in high places. And he said unequivocally, uh, unequivocally, Jason, that the Central Intelligence Agency was in collusion with the Church of Scientology during wow. the 1960s. That's Miles Copeland and his memoirs in, entitled The Game Player, Occultism in High Places. He said the Central Intelligence Agency was in collusion, was in cahoots with Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard in the 1960s. Mm. Now, if you get a chance, uh, Jason, uh, type in uh, beginning of the 1990s, okay, Greek police executed raids uh, in Athens, Greece, okay? Beginning in the 1990s, Greek police executed raids in Athens, Greece, and in Athens, Greece, of the Church of Scientology, or simply go to orthochristian.com. That's capital O-R-T-H-O, Christian. No spaces or dashes in between. Uh, orthochristian.com. And it says um, specifically, there, and it shows a document, which is around the 10th photo down, Jason, okay? It shows that the Church of Scientology um, was rendered by the CIA. It said specifically that the CIA rendered to Scientology's foreign branches. And there's a copy of the document that's, I would say, the 10th photo down uh, in orthochristian.com or just type in the Greek police uh, raid the Church of Scientology. There, and I believe in facts. I believe in proof. So there is a, a document, an unclassified Greek governmental document that shows the, uh, the CIA's complicity within the Church of Scientology. It's interesting, Jason, that I didn't bring this up until, um, uh, until today, that on page 336 of the original edition, when I say original edition, it may not be in the present day Dianetical book, but in the original edition, uh, Jason, on page 336 of Dianetics, it's almost, I would say, around three quarters in the book where most people would not even uh, see it. They were missing. And I think that was designed by L. Ron Hubbard. He says in the original edition on page 336 of the book Dianetics, and I quote, The seven-year-old girl who shudders because a man kisses her is not computing. She is reacting to an engram since at age seven. She should see nothing wrong in a kiss, not even a passionate one. There must have been an earlier experience, possibly prenatal, 
which made men or kissing very bad. In other words, of this original edition of Dianetics on page 336, which may not be in the uh, present day Dianetics because it's probably removed by the Church of Scientology. It's suggesting, uh, Jason, that this seven-year-old girl should see nothing wrong in a man's passionate kiss. And Tony Ortega brings this up as well. So in other words, I'm not exposing any particular person outside of L. Ron Hubbard. What I'm doing is exposing the very dogma or doctrine of Dianetics, which is the foundation of the Church of Scientology. Now, it's interesting, uh, Jason, as we move forward here on Scientology, the third open war of deception. Page 70 of the book entitled, Which Cult in Western Europe? A Study in Anthropology. Again, which cult in Western Europe? A Study in Anthropology. Okay. Uh, um, so it says here on page uh, 70, that the term uh, scientific, which we call Scientology today, the term scientific is a interconnected word of the term Dianism. We talked about that, or Dianetic. So then this, this book, which was um, published in 1921 through the Oxford Clarendon Press of 1921, page 70, that Scientology is a cult that's rooted not only in the goddess of Diana in Acts 19.28, but it is also a perfect representation of Jason of the pan-European goddess Diana, Dianic, Dianetics. So then through Scientology, this is the template, Jason, of this uh, of what we call mental health through Scientology, where it only cleans the trauma, Jason, but does not remove the trauma. I, I got to preface that. It only cleans, okay, or compartmentalize the trauma, but it never removes the trauma, okay? So in 1971, uh, through the FDA, L. Ron Hubbard was forced to put a label on every e-meter stating that the e-meter uh, can never take away diseases. And let me preface that. In the 1971 FDA report through the Food, Food and Drug Administration, uh, L. Ron Hubbard had to label every e-meter stating, and I quote, that the e-meter uh, can never take away diseases. It was not designed. But yet the Church of Scientology is propagating a lie through this third open war of deception. You and I talked about the term thetan. Now in Scientology, they, that represents the soul, that represents the consciousness. And that term thetan is interconnected to the Greek word theta, capital T-H-E-T-A. Well, that's interesting. That goes back to our Black Greek life societies of Delta Sigma Theta or Iota Phi Theta. So the in Persian mythology, Jason, Theta was also a high-ranking demon in Persian demonology. Another topic for another day. Yeah. There's another book, and I believe I brought this up on last week, The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence by Victor Marchetti and John D. Marx. That book was banned up until two years ago, uh, my friend. It said, and I quote, that the Church of Scientology is a weaponized tool of psychiatry where they use precognition, cognition, and retrocognition. Now, remember the 2002 movie Minority Report with yeah. most popular... Ah, and it talks about pre-call. That term pre-call is always stated throughout the movie. That is a church of Scientology 
template type of movie. So all of your listeners, if you have never watched that movie, definitely get that on DVD, okay, or watch it online. So then through minority... Wait, Bishop, sorry, there's something important I want to raise about Minority Report, because you've spoken about Jack Parsons and his relationship with L. Ron Hubbard. So Jack Parsons was connected to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's escaping me right now, but there was also a connection to Enrico Fermi, who was a particle physicist who mm -hmm. was pivotal in the creation of particle colliders and the Large Hadron Collider wow. at CERN. And the initial purpose of that Large Hadron Collider, or at least one of the stated purposes of Enrico Fermi, was to use it to open a man-made singularity to communicate with extraterrestrial beings. Now, whether or not that's possible, it's certainly something that they wanted to do. I would also point out that quantum computing is only mm -hmm. possible due to quantum physics, which particle colliders and all of this stuff deal with uh, superposition of particles and quantum mechanics and all this sort of thing. And, you know, when you mentioned CIA and the cult of intelligence, the first person to tell me about that was uh, recovering CIA officer Kevin Shipp, who appears with me uh, monthly on the intelligence assessment, another show that we offer on Patreon. Kevin said that the CIA is working with Amazon.com, and people have heard about this cloud data storage contract that Amazon.com has with the CIA. It was a $600 million contract. We know that Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon.com, also owns the Washington Post and Whole Foods and all that. But what Kevin told us is that their intention is to use all this big data aggregation and quantum computing to create predictive models, not only to know if you and I have a conversation about the movie Minority Report, perhaps later yeah. today you'll get an ad on your phone to download the movie. But uh, that's responding to words that are spoken near your phone that get heard by voice recognition, and then you've somewhere on an app clicked OK, send me ads based on what I say. What Kevin Shipp suggests is that there is an intention on the part of the CIA to create a supercomputer that processes big data to predict human behavior. That you know what, my friend, you, you're hitting another another nerve in me. I'm going to get into um, what they call Project Snow White during the 1970s and 80s, and really up until the middle part of the 90s, uh, the Church and Scientology infiltrated the federal government, including the CIA and the FBI through Operation Snow White, okay, to set up moles. And matter of fact, like I said last week, the intelligence agency part uh, of the Church of Scientology is called the Guardian's Office, okay? Mm. And I'm going to get into some high-level spies, okay, uh, of Scientologists who infiltrated the Pentagon, the CIA, the FBI, so what you just said that it hit another nerve with me. Again, Jason, you're a great host. This is the reason why it is so important for people on Crowdsource to Truth to have an open mind to, to be awakened into, into the very spirit of what we're talk, talking about. And, and I think I touched on last week, Ronald DeWolf, and like I did probably about 15, 20 minutes ago, uh, the estranged son uh, of uh, L. Ron Hubbard. He had said through this massive database that was kept by the uh, spy agency department within Scientology, the Guardian's office, he said under oath, okay, in an affidavit that the term sex, sex, sex was always the key word asked by the altar term, okay, uh, so that they could keep these words in the reaction of the candidate in their database. And so his father, L. Ron Hubbard, but it's interesting that Ronald DeWolf's grandfather, the father of L. Ron Hubbard, was a man by the name of Harry Ross Hubbard, uh, who was a newspaper man in Omaha, Nebraska, but was fascinated uh, with concerning black magic, okay, including uh, L. Ron Hubbard's mother, Lodora May Hubbard, who was a practitioner of black magic uh, occultism and huh. hypnosis. And wow. so I wanted to bring that up. And, and again, I'm not bashing any of your listeners who are Scientologists. 
my assignment here today is to expose the origins, the originations, or what I, the word I love to use, the historicity of yeah. the Church of Scientology here. And so, matter of fact, uh, th there's something, there was a, a term, a name, a word that came to my mind. It's called the Brain Initiative. That's a CIA program that was really funded during the Obama administration called the Brain Initiative Program. And look it up because they are, are using Scientologists even today uh, within uh, Operation Project Brain In Initiative. Another Is it from the National day. Institute of Health? Yes. Wow. It, absolutely. In, in conjunction with the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI, the Brain Initiative uh, with Scientologists, with scholars, uh, within the scientific realm, uh, are working to create super soldiers. And, and that's nothing new. We, You and I have been hearing about the super soldier conspiracy for years. Our brains are remarkable. Miraculous, even. But they can't do everything. Unless we give them a little high-tech help. When children see the movie The Matrix, and they see Neo jacking an electrode and all of a sudden becoming a gung fu master, the first question they ask is, how can I get one? Well, this does not yet exist, but it's actually physically possible. The key to transforming learning from an organic process to a machine-like downloading of information is a squiggly bit of brain known as the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the gateway to memories. Short-term memories are stored right here in the prefrontal cortex, but eventually they have to be transferred to long-term memories, and that's where the hippocampus comes in. This part of the brain doesn't store the memories, but it does the appropriate conversion. At the University of Southern California, bioengineer Ted Berger has already proven that a computer chip can replace or enhance brain function. Right now, what our prosthesis does is to convert a code that's kind of in the middle of the hippocampus to what would be the output of the hippocampus. They've been able to take mice and access the electrical signals coursing through the hippocampus and record them. And then when they shot the message back into the hippocampus, the mouse remembered the task. We found that we can not only restore long-term memories, we can enhance the animal's ability to remember. You could think about using devices like this to greatly enhance human memory and to shorten the cycle for learning in terms of uh, downloading huge quantities of memory at a single time. Chips that augment our hippocampus could very well help us learn faster. So will that make them a must-have for competitive parents? At that point, it could create an arms race in elementary school. Rumors go out that, well, Jones's kid, he's been enhanced, and our Johnny has to compete with this enhanced kid. The reality is that with these kinds of technologies, they do not get distributed to everyone at the same time. Some people get it first, some people get it better. As a society, we have to really think long and hard about who gets this? If it's just the wealthy, that there are uh, real dangers that they will use it to consolidate their power and their wealth. They would use uh, a knocking magic, I kid you not, Jason, to build super soldiers, to win psychological warfares. That's Scientology, winning psychological occultic warfare. So then L. Ron Hubbard, uh, settled with the FDA, like I said a few minutes ago in 1971, that uh, he had to put a label in all of his e-meters stating that the e-meter was not a tool for the diagnosis of any disease. He am a Scientologist. So then the e-meter was not a tool, is not a tool for any uh, diagnosis of any disease. So then remember, Jason, uh, back in 1947, you and I talked 
about this last week. In the 1947 letter that L. Ron Hubbard's uh, entitled, L. Ron Hubbard's Unanswered Letter of Despair to the VA. Again, L. Ron Hubbard's Unanswered Letter of Despair to the VA. And you can find that on military.id.me. It talks about um, that L. Ron Hubbard had psych psychological problems, psychotical problems. Now, he dies on January 24th, 1986, but he had a stroke, uh, Jason, uh, about a week before his death. Now, following his stroke, L. Ron Hubbard, his physician, Dr. Gene Dink, capital D-E-N-K, D-E-N-K, gave L. Ron Hubbard injections of uh, Vistaral, can they allow me to spell it? Capital V I S T A R I L, which is a antipsychotic drug. Jason, he was mm. a man that is anti-psychology, anti-psychiatric. He is against the American psychological complex. He's against the DSM five, the Diagnostic. Uh, statistical manual of the American Psychiatric and Psychological Association, but yet um, he is dying because of an antipsychotic drug, which uh, doctors use to treat mental disorders, mental disease, and mental syndromes. It's also treated to uh, treat anxiety. So what I'm doing here, Jason, is exposing the hypocrisy of the founder of the Church of Scientology. His name was L. Ron Hubbard. You and I talked about on last week that back in the 1500s and I believe the early part of the 1800s up until 1608, John D., right? Dr. John D., uh, during um, the time of Queen Elizabeth I, was an astrologer, was an occultist was a modifier of what we call altitur. So the, the, the art or the craft of modification in altitude did not start with L. Ron Hubbard. It goes back to the 1500s. John D., uh, who was a high-ranking spy within the British Empire, okay, uh, was a master practitioner of what we call Anakian keys. Um, the the uh, Anakian, uh, uh, what we call psychological warfare. So then what John D. did, my friend, if you and I wanted to see Queen Elizabeth I in her court, we would have to go through a modification, uh, what we call transcendental prayer, transcendental prayer, which transcendental Transcendence means a higher state of consciousness of existence, that the higher the existence, the higher the probability that you and I would see Queen Elizabeth I. So the court of Queen Elizabeth was called the Golden Dawn. L. Ron Herbert taught a series, The Golden Dawn. We talked about the 2002 Minority Report movie that talks about precognition, cognition, retrocognition with Tom Cruise. So John D. Uh, was a practitioner of the science and mental health cognition field. Now, it's interesting, uh, Jason, that L. Ron Hubbard wrote a book that is actually now banned. He wrote a book called Child Dianetics, again, Child, child Dianetics, yes, in 1976. Wow. Uh, it, it talks about Dianetic Processing for Children. Within that book, my friend, he talks about the complete, he writes about the complete mystical records of John D., where L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who is teaching parents how to Dianetically process their children, um, he is transcribing from the 16th century occultist and warlock, John D., concerning, get this, angel channeling. So then through angel channeling, through the altification of the mind that John uh, D. was teaching through witchcraft, the term of angel channeling. Okay, we talk about clairvoyance, clearing. So then, according 
to the Encyclopedia of New Age Beliefs, written by one of the most powerful theologians in this country, uh, well qualified to talk about this topic, John, Dr. John Ankerberg and John Wilden. They talk about, my friend, uh, in chapters three, four, and five, that Babylon working in 1946. L. Ron Hubbard moved into the home of Jack Parsons uh, the year before in 1945 in right. Pasadena, California. Yeah. Jack Parsons, like you had said a couple of minutes ago, um, he was a rocket propulsion researcher uh, at the California Institution of Technology. Uh, he was a part of Alyssa Crawley's Orator uh, Templi Orientis. Uh, he was uh, also a part of the Theosophical Society. So then, as we're uh, condensing and breaking down Scientology, the third open war of deception, and to all of your listeners, continue to keep up with me because I'm going at, at a speed that is going to raise your consciousness to a level that you will never see Scientology in the same light again. L. Ron Hubbard, Jack Parson. Uh, now, there is a book here, um, a a uh, university study, and this university study uh, is called Naveen. Let me let me spell that: capital N V M E N, which is the academic study of religion, and the IHR, capital I A H R, which means the International Association for the History of Religions, and that was edited by Tim Jensen and Armin W. Gertz. That they correspond the NIVMEN, capital N, uh, capital N V M E N, to the Greek word next them, capital N X I V M. Now remember well, the next them. the sex cult, right? I was going to yeah. say it sounds just like it. Keith Rainier. Now, Keith Rainier uh, was a Scientologist. Now, I guarantee you there are going to be people that's going to be calling you off the hook saying Bishop is lying. Listen, Keith Rainier and his co-founder, a woman uh, by the name of Nancy Salman, capital S-A-L-Z-A-Z-M-A-N, capital S-A-L-Z-M-A-N. Now, it's interesting about this Nancy Salman, uh, uh, my friend. She is a close, was a close friend uh, of the Brothman sisters, right. Claire Brothman and Sarah Brothman of the Brothman Seagram's dynasty out right. of Montreal, Canada, okay, where their, I believe their great grandfather, Samuel Brothman, during Prohibition, uh, shipped in alcohol into the United States, another topic for another day. So, uh, so we talk about uh, Neve them or Nexium being a sex cult, okay? Where Nancy Salmon were, was responsible for branding women, okay? Mm -hmm. And this cult was backed by Brothman money, okay? Now, there is a cult investigator by the name of Rick Ross, not the rapper, but the cult investigator. He talks about what did Keith Rainier take from Scientology? He says everything. In the op-ed uh, on Tony Ortega's The Underground Bunker, March 8, 2019, he talks about Keith uh, Rainier and the connection to his hero, L. Ron Hubbard, are 100% in right connection. So the inside connections, Jason, um, between this next film, N -I -N -X -I -V -M, and Scientology can also be uh, seen and read on the Epic Times, the EpicTimes.com, June 26, 2019. Now, Scientology, the third open war of deception. I want to get back to Dr. John D. here for a minute, something that I found out uh, on last night in researching, in my deep research, in preparing uh, for you, uh, my brother. John D., and for all of your listeners, if you get a chance, uh, type in John D. Dash Hexen, capital H E X E N 2039. John D. Dash Hexen, capital H E X E N 2039. John D. was a practitioner of 
we call remote viewing. Remote viewing is another, another term for clairvoyance or clearvoyance. So Hexen 2039, this is where we get the term hex or hexology or hexism, that which is a hex or a curse. Hexen 2039, uh, it talks about the new military occult technology, Jason, mm -hmm. for psychological warfare. Okay. And you can find this also uh, concerning the same topic on, on Suzanne Trister, S U Z A N N E T R E I S T E R dot net. Suzanne Trister dot net. It talks about that John D was not only a modifier, an auditor during the 1500s up until his death in, in 1608. But he was also a practitioner of what we call scrying, capital S-C-R-Y-I-N-G, scrying. Now, what is a scryer? A scryer is a person that gazes into like what we call a crystal ball. Now, a scryer is another term for witch or warlock or clairvoyer, one who looks into that which has been cleared or modified. So John D has a heavy connection. We're talking about Scientology, the third open war of deception here on Cross was the truth. John D has a heavy connection, uh, Jason, to Sir Francis uh, Wash Washingham. Capital W A L S I N G H A M. Uh, Francis Washingham was the founder, Jason, of the British Secret Service. So then, John D., who was also a high ranking spy within the British Empire during the 1500s up until his death in 1608, works with the British Secret Service to predict through scrying through modification, through altering future military wars, okay? Jason, this is a precursor mm -hmm. to the 1972 to 1995 U.S. military remote viewing program, okay? Right. that movie, yeah. The Men Who Stare at Goats. Ah, uh, exactly. We talked about goat riding, I believe, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Remote viewing Yes, it's see it all interconnects. Every part, every part of this eight part series on eugenics to your listeners. If you have not listened to all eight parts, even up to this very present day, listen to the prior seven. In order to understand what I'm talking about today, you have to listen to the prior seven parts of eugenics. So this uh, U.S. military backed remote viewing program. Um, what we call Enochian language in keys. And we talked about that word 15, 20 minutes ago. The Enochian language in keys, Jason, was adapted by Alester Crawley, including Jack Parsons, including L. Ron Hubbard, where he mentions of the term remote viewing in his 1938 book, Excalibur. Excalibur is connected to the Knights of the Round Table, like you talked about last week. So through remote viewing, and L. Ron Hubbard was a lover of, of what we call remote viewing drawings. That's another topic for another day. Uh, and so if all of your listeners, if you get a chance, just type in supernatural abilities in Scientology. Supernatural <laughs> abilities in Scientology on Wikipedia with multiple links that will lead you to links that were verified what I'm about to say. So in Scientology, uh, it talks about uh, uh, telepathic senses or what we call telekinesis, remote viewing, telekinesis. That's through the e-meter machine. OK, now it talks about also, Jason, and this is really powerful stuff what I'm about to, to reveal to you, my friend. There was two Scientologists, one by the, a man by the name of Hal uh, Putoff, capital P-U-T-H-O-F-F, -F, and Ingo Swan, capital I-N-G-O Swan, capital S-W-A-N-N. They were Scientologists, Jason, okay, who worked 
for the Stanford Research Institute, which was the CIA, CIA's project called Project Stargate. Now, remember the 1994 movie Stargate? Yeah. That was a CIA-funded Hollywood movie. All of this traces back to L. Ron Hubbard. So the, through remote viewing, Hal Putoff and Ingo Swan, both Scientologists, worked at the Stanford Research Center for the Central Intelligence Agency's Project Stargate in the 1970s, where they examined parapsychology research along with another Scientologist, a man by the name of Russell Targ, capital T-A-R-G. Now, in the 1990s, Jason, we're talking about Scientology, the third open war of deception. During the 1990s, Stargate Project, okay, uh, which had a code, which was the code word, Stargate Project was the code word in 1991, that was used by the U.S. Army unit, established in 1978, guess where? At Fort Meade, Maryland. Through the DIA, Jason, the Defense Intelligence Agency, where the DIA today is infiltrated with Scientologists. Really? Remember the 1994 movie Stargate? Uh, you just get ready to say something, Jason? Well, I'm just surprised to hear that. I mean, people are going to remember that uh, General Michael Flynn was the director of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. I didn't know anything about uh, Scientology being involved with that. Yeah, they, they are. As a matter of fact, um, through Operation Snow White, that has not ended. And this is the reason why the Church of Scientology is untouched today. This is the reason why. Because they are interwoven, Jason, the Church of Scientology, with the Central Intelligence Agency, including the FBI. Even though the FBI uh, raided many Scientology uh, churches throughout the country. And I believe if, if, if he has not changed his mind, I believe Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, has banned Scientology. Now, if there are, if there are Scientology centers and churches, it means that Putin changed his mind. But I know back going back 10, 20 years ago, Putin wanted nothing to do with Scientology. So then if you're, let's just get an opportunity, Jason. Type in Clearwater Sun, Nancy and her neo-Nazis. Again, Clearwater Sun, that's a newspaper in Clearwater, Florida. Nancy and her neo-Nazis, December 1979. And you can also find that on uh, lemanet.org, capital L-E-R-M-A-N-E-T, uh, lemanet.org. It shows, Jason, a photo of a Scientologist wearing a Nazi Ooh. uniform. Yeah. It shows. Now, what I'm about to say, I cannot substantiate what I'm about to say, my friend. They're saying that that could have been uh, the father of David uh, Miskevich, the present day director and, and, and leader of the Church of Scientology. They cannot be substantiated. OK, but that photo is showing a Scientologist wearing a Nazi uniform. Wait a minute now. But they're connected to the hip to the nation of Islam. L. Ron Hubbard was a known racist. So L. Ron Hubbard is a known racist. Why is Louis Farrakhan connected to Scientology? There's another website. And, and just type in, would Scientology have been popular in Nazi Germany? Would Scientology have been popular in Nazi Germany? Okay. Uh, many Scientologists, Jason, and you can look that up on the Quora.com, capital Q-U-O-R-A.com. And to your Scientologist listeners, just have an open mind. Scientologists, okay, even today, they 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 were taught, they were taught by R. Ron Hubbard, even up to this very present day, and have an open mind that they were Nazis in their past lifetimes, Jason. Wow. Scientologists. A powerful story uh, in the, um, just look up the terms clear takeover. 
okay? Clear Takeover or projects.tampabay.com. Projects.tampabay.com. Clear Takeover. It shows that the Church of Scientology, my friend, has taken over Clearwater, Florida. They are spending millions and millions of dollars taking over property within clear, notice, clear water, Florida. Now, remember, as we, and give me about two minutes and we're done here, Jason, as we wrap up this um, eight-part series on mm -hmm. eugenics. Mm -hmm. There was a, a spy master, okay, uh, within the Church of Scientology, a man by the name of Henning Helt, Henning, capital H-E-N-N-I-N-G, Helt, capital H-E-L-D, like in David T. Henning Helt, uh, Jason, was a spy master within the Church of Scientology, going back to the 1970s, who went to prison for L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, he was second in command of the Guardian Office, which is the intelligence arm of the Church of Scientology. So then uh, he was the deputy guardian of the spy master of the Guardian Office which was, and which is still is, the um, spy network apparatus of the Church of Scientology. Through Snow White, through the Snow White program, Project Snow White, during the 70s and 80s, uh, this man, Henny Helt, okay, along with the wife of L. Ron Hubbard, Mary Sue Hubbard, who was the director of the Guardian's office, okay, infiltrated the FBI, infiltrated uh, the CIA, infiltrated every department of the U.S. government. How does this happen, Jason? Yeah, and the intelligence community is in complicity with the Church of Scientology. Now, there's a woman who's a, the top spy master in England for the Church of Scientology. Her name is Jane Kimbler, capital K-E-M-B-L-E. -E. And so, in other words, she was, if she's still alive, was the top spy master for the Church, uh, for the Church of Scientology within the United Kingdom. And so, with KGB backing, uh, my friend, going back to the 60s, okay, in connection to MK Ultra, okay, the EBARC interrogation program of the Central Intelligence Agency, where they also had an Operation Snow White. So all of the tactics that the Church of Scientology uses, Jason, are the same uh, interrogational tactics, okay, that the CIA uses. Huh. So then they're in cahoots with each other. So there's front companies today, and I believe that um, on last week, I touched on, remember the, the opium wars, okay? We talked about the opium wars, okay? Yeah. Uh, from 19, 1839 to 1860. And by the way, uh, someone just sent me an email. Uh, they wanted me to go over, um, when I said last week, that Dianetics in the Church in Scientology uh, is a mixture uh, of the Theosophical Society. They are the, a mixture of the Thelema Seeker Society. Yeah. They are a mixture of the Rosh Hashirin Society, of the Philosophical Society of Manly P. Hall, okay? The Kemenic Orthodoxy that they teach. But getting to, and we're done here, to the two opium wars from 1839 to 1860. William Jordan and James Matheson, there is a corporation today called the Jardine uh, Matheson Corporation, which 10 years ago, I don't know if, uh, if this is the case today, Jason, but 10 years ago, the Church of Scientology had stock in the Jardine Matheson Corporation in Hong Kong. This is the reason why I connect the Church of Scientology with the history of the two opium wars. The first Opium War, 1839 to 1842. The second Opium War from 1856 to 1860. Journey Matheson has a descendant from his progenitor. 
and that is Vaughnie Matheson. Oh. Or Dave Vaughnie, okay? So these connections, someone wrote on, on, on your page the other day, man, I got on your YouTube page. They said, Bishop, why are you connecting so many dots? That See, this is, we have to stop thinking lazy. We have to stop thinking on a lazy level. We have to connect these historical dots. So then the Journey Matheson Corporation is a multi-billion dollar global conglomerate corporation because of past open wars. Robert Bennett Forbes has a descendant, Steve Forbes, of the Forbes magazine. Do you know, my friend, that Robert Bennett Forbes, along with William Jardine, okay, and uh, along with James Matheson, profited from the opium drug trade? Well, I was going to say, Bishop, I don't know if you can see the screen share right now, but look at that logo for this Jardine Matheson company. Is it, uh, I mean, it looks like wow, kind of I like a cartoon that. of a poppy plant, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, my God. And you know what, Jason? I, I got to confess, I have never, I never saw that as a poppy plant before until you just said it just now. But it's got to be. Th this, <laughs> it's got to be. And, and that is not by accident. Hmm. That's not by accident. They're proud so, of their origins. Absolutely. They are proud. And, and there's a book called The CIA uh, as Organized Crime by Douglas Valentine. Yep. The CIA as organized uh, crime by Douglas Valentine, who talks about the two opium wars and that the third opium war is the opium war of religion. That religion has become the opium of the people. So then oh, James yeah. Matheson, William Jordan, Robert Bennett Forbes connecting to Steve Forbes, Forbes magazine in the Forbes uh, dynasty are all interconnected to this conspiracy through Scientology, okay? And I just want to wrap up this def this um, this eight-part series. And to your listeners, uh, my friend, if everyone, if you get a chance, look up the uh, logo, okay, um, for the what I call the United States Intelligence Community logo, okay? Uh, on orthochristian.com, orthochristian.com, or just type in United States Intelligence Community logo. It has an eight-pointed star, which is the exact amount of points of the Church of Scientology's logo. Not mm. just the two pyramids, but the cross, all right? The Rosh the Rosh Sharon cross, the eight-pointed cross, which is connected to the intelligence community today, my friend. This right, that, that Rosicrucian call, uh, cross came up earlier in the show. I didn't mention it, but I was showing it on screen, I think, the uh, Scientology cross. And I had, I, I, can't recall, I can't recall if it was you, Bishop, who I was asking about all these different things that have the word rose in them. Um, yeah. The, uh, the, um, Sorry, I had a call coming in there. Some people probably don't like what we're talking about. But yeah. the Rose term shows up so frequently. Uh, Rose yeah. Law Firm, we've got this Rosemont, uh, something or other that was sending money to uh, Hunter Biden. We've got Nappy Rose Productions, which was Richard Mendenhall's company. There's all these different Rose things. Oh, the, no, no, there was the whistleblower who is the uh, impeachment CIA whistleblower whose name we're not allowed to mention on YouTube. He, uh, he's got a lawyer named Mark Zaid who's got some Rose-linked charity that pays for the law, the legal defense of these whistleblowers. And, and, and to your listeners, oh, man, I got you hit another, another uh, nerve with me with the term Rose. Uh, Rose to your Compass. listeners. Yeah, Compass Rose. Rose. Ah, exactly. There is a plantation in Jamaica, a historical plantation called Rose Hall. That it's in Montego Bay. Rose Hall. So look up the history of Rose Hall. Okay, and the owners, the Palmers. Okay, were uh, Scientologists of that day who were practitioners uh, of the scientific method of what they call clairvoyance. 
where they would decapitate their slave and then use the organs of the decapitated slaves as an offering uh, unto the gods, unto um, a matter of fact, they, they practice what they call parapsychology and psychic surgery, the decapitation of slaves, psychic surgery, and also um, the palmers, okay, uh, practice, and, and excuse me, I'm about to say, Jason, they were practitioners of what they call urine therapy, urine, yes. They would force their slaves to drink urine uh, for the purification of their slaves to have strength to work in the fields. So the Rose Hall, and, and matter of fact, there's an old tradition of the witch of Rose Hall, okay, who had um, traditionally, according to tradition, murdered her husbands and murdered her slaves. I just wanted to point that out because you hit a nerve with me concerning the term rose here. Uh, there was uh, one of the, the plantation owner was a man by the name of John Palmer, okay? John Palmer and his wife, Annie Palmer. Annie Palmer had murdered three of her husbands, including John Palmer. Annie Palmer was a practitioner of Scientology before there was an L. Ron Hubbard. Ooh. So Jamaicans, they know what I'm talking about. So that Rose Hall, Annie Palmer, who was a high-ranking witch, she knew parapsychology and phrenology, psychic surgery by decapitating people. That's what the auditor does today, uh, my friend. No, they don't decapitate people physically, but they decapitate them psychologically. The E-meter is a present-day psychic surgery phenomenon, okay? Reiki, urine therapy, which was uh, perfected by John W. Armstrong, who was a Scientologist before there was an L. Ron Hubbard. But people are going to say, I don't believe it, Bishop. I really don't care because my job is to expose the truth. So when you said Rose, um, uh, man, I got it hit a nerve with me. So Rose Hall, Montego Bay, uh, look up that history as we close out uh, this eight part eugenics series entitled Scientology, the Third Open War of Deception. Wow. So many connections there, Bishop. So the Church of Scientology is paying off local government officials who are Democrats, paying them all to take over Clearwater, Florida. And if President Trump is listening, he's got to shut down the Church of Scientology. It's not a religion. It's a cult. That's why the federal government through the FBI was going to shut it down during the 70s. The L. Ron Hubbard legally changed it from a corporation to a religion so that the, his religion could be protected. But it is a cult. That's all it is, which is the third uh, uh, opium war of deception. And the term opium comes from the Sanskrit term opion, right? Capital O-P-I-O-N, which means modification, clearing, okay? The uh, departmentalized, the, uh, the compartmentalization of one's thinking, okay? That goes back to Scientology. Monarch multiples are not single purpose appliances but biological robots containing alters capable of performing any task their programmer might anticipate. While monarch mind control is solely a 20th century creation, its predecessors date back to ancient Egypt and Babylon. The Egyptian Book of the Dead explicitly described methods of torture and intimidation to create trauma, the use of drugs and hypnotism, ultimately resulting in total enslavement of the initiate. It would, however, be the Nazis and their sinister scientists who turned association into a science and mind control into an art. Psychiatrists such as the notorious Dr. Joseph Mengele conducted horrific experiments on concentration camp inmates in an effort to refine their mind control techniques. Many Holocaust survivors had nightmares of Mengele and the experiments they had been a part of. Some loved him as a father figure all their lives due to the trauma bonding they had received as part of their programming. They discovered that through traumatization, different personalities or dissociated parts could be created who do not know each other but can take the body at different times. 
After the war, these Nazi psychiatrists were brought to the U.S. through what was known as Project Paperclip. Project Paperclip was the code name under which the U.S. intelligence and military services extracted German Nazi scientists during and after the final stages of World War II. Mengele, along with other Nazi doctors and psychiatrists, now continued to experiment and develop trauma-based mind control for the Americans. Under what would later become known as MKUltra, the United States government systematically drugged, tortured, and murdered their own citizens for decades. Exposed in the 70s through lawsuits filed by Canadian survivors, MKUltra ultimately included over 150 operations, all relating to behavior modification, trauma, brainwashing, drugs, blackmail, and mind control experiments. Among these mind control experiments orchestrated by Nazi war criminals were continuations of the trauma-based programming which creates dissociated identities. Rape, electroshock, drugs, and hypnosis were all used by the CIA to create their very own mind-controlled multiples. A criminal faction within the U.S. government, devoid of any conscious or feeling of personal responsibility, tortured and programmed children to create valuable mind control assets. Most researchers believe these programs continue secretly to this day. The CIA's original plans to research mind control was to determine psychological and chemical means of creating the perfect spy, which quickly evolved into production of the perfect soldier, perfect assassin, and eventually, slave. With the introduction of Nazi research, particularly that of SS officer and occultic Heinrich Himmler and Joseph Mengele, it was determined that absolute mind control could be reached through specific tortures beginning at a young age. Armed with this nefarious information, U.S., German, and British psychiatrists embarked on a new yet ancient form of total mind control. Disturbingly, instead of ending in 1973 as the U.S. government claims, Closer research shows the program merely involved into what was known as Project Monarch. MKUltra was a broad study into a wide variety of mind control techniques, and Monarch was its logical outgrowth, taking the most effective methodologies and applying them to the creation of a total mind-controlled slave, a true Manchurian candidate. Today, mind control multiples are still being created at a scale never before imagined. They are in all walks of life. The entertainment industry in particular is known to be filled with monarch multiples. One reason mind control is prevalent within the entertainment industry is because they are able to control the powerful influence these entertainers possess over the public. Not only can messages disseminated through music and films be controlled, they can then have celebrities create distractions to divert public attention. Many entertainers have shown scars and behavior consistent with that of trauma-based mind control victims. Today, a multitude of groups and organizations are performing trauma-based mind control on victims of all walks of life. But how are these mind control multiples created? In just a moment, the disturbing details. The hideous process of creating a monarch typically begins at a young age. Children of elite, multi-generational occultic families will be traumatized starting in the womb, sometimes even going so far as to induce a premature birth. Experts have likened splitting the mind to splitting wood. Getting an initial split going is rather difficult, but once you have a crack beginning to form, it gets easier with each strike. Likewise, the elite know that if they can traumatize the mind when it is young, it will split easier and dissociate more quickly. For this reason, elite families will put a mouse trap on their baby's hand while in the crib and not go into the room to remove it until the infant stops crying. This teaches the baby's mind to dissociate from pain, which is then rewarded with mommy's attention. If not born into this madness, testing will typically take place to gauge the ability to dissociate. Sometimes, people from domestically abusive environments will be chosen specifically because of their heightened dissociative abilities. The second aspect that must be considered is IQ. A great deal of intelligence and creativity is required to create these dissociated personalities. Personality tests, along with IQ, ultimately determine the child's future role. Once the candidate has been selected, preparation will begin. While multi-generational victims inherit the mental structuring required to begin programming, others must be conditioned. Controllers will begin expanding the child's mind as soon as it is born, teaching it not only to create images, but associate a smell or sound with memory. Creativity and intelligence are gently enhanced. 
The child will be taught discipline and trained to be able to hold still and keep their eyes open for long periods. This will be helpful later during EEG testing. For the first year and a half, the monarch child is smothered with love in what is known as the love bombing phase. Once a good ability to dissociate and an IQ of at least 120 is confirmed, programmers will proceed with the first step, shattering the core. In direct contrast to the absolute love and attention the child has received thus far, he or she will now be alone, tortured and abused. Loud noise and various smells will overwhelm the brain's sensory input. After some time, the primary programmer or handler, who has thus far shown only kindness towards the child, will arrive. To the victim, this is a welcome sight. It appears help has arrived. This time, however, the programmer will brutally traumatize the victim. The shock shatters the mind like glass. The brain simply cannot reconcile these two extremely opposite behaviors from the same person. The cognitive dissonance is too great. Experts have learned this is how the core is split. Once the splitting of the core is accomplished, the mind can be divided and compartmentalized through further abuse and trauma. As the victim's programming begins, it is meticulously monitored, charts are kept, and programming schedules are set. Programmers will use specific tortures to create splits. The conscious mind, which makes us who we are, takes flight and essentially says, I can't handle anymore, I'm out of here. When this happens, the unconscious is left wide open and the victim is left in a dangerously suggestible state. Dissociation creates the opening of the unconscious. This vulnerable state is characterized by rapid eye movement, heightened sensitivity to shadows or surrounding movement. The subject is highly hypnotizable and can be told to create new parts within its mind. The fractured, dissociated mind has no ability to question what is being told. You get tortured far enough or traumatized far enough your dominant personality just goes to sleep and what's left and this is a normal human reaction to excessive trauma to protect you and what's left is a very childlike persona of yourself from when you're about five or six yeah and you have no ability to resist you're vulnerable and then that's when they hypnotize you Dissociation is the key to all this. The Delta Wavelength is used to program super soldiers and assassins. The programming is designed to create agents devoid of fear or self-preservation, capable of incredible feats of physical endurance and hand-to-hand -hand combat. One who kills, and if caught, self-destructs. Programmed at the Delta level are trained assassins. For those who refuse to accept that US intelligence would torture their own people, Simply imagine the value and effectiveness of a marksman with 40 times visual acuity and unparalleled skill and determination. Some of these hidden altars are highly trained super soldiers who complete their mission and return home never remembering the event. You could have a person who would be able to commit assassinations for you or do any other kind of important work like courier work. And if they get caught, you can just give them up. It's not a problem. Uh, because they themselves don't even know what they did. It's the ultimate tool for any spy agency. Question. Did Syria's ambassador tell the United Nations that the United States has genetically modified super soldiers in his country? The ambassador, the Syrian ambassador to the United Nations, Dr. Bashar Jafari, made a cryptic remark uh, a few days ago at the United Nations, he was talking about that, you know, his nation was being falsely accused, that these were fa false flag, fake chemical attacks. And, you know, so, so you were listening to his comments and it sounds, you know, normal what he's saying. But then he, he mentioned genetically modified entities. Yes. And I had to stop and rewind and listen to it again. And, Listen to it again. Listen to it again. I, I want to play the video. Again, this is Syria's ambassador to the United Nations. We're only going to play the part where he's talking about genetically modified somethings in his country. Watch this. 
to say to Saudi Arabia today that we eliminated its terrorist tentacles in eastern Ghouta, and I mean Jaysh al-Islam gangs. Yes, we say to Qatar and Turkey that we eliminated their terrorist tentacles in eastern Ghouta, and I mean al-Nusra Front gangs and Falak al-Rahman gangs. And I say to all those who exported to us armed, moderate, genetically modified opposition that we eliminated these toxic exports. And we call upon those exporters to bear the consequences of their actions as some elements who survived would return to their original countries. All right. Doc? <laughs> We, we've been doing True News a long time. <laughs> this is one of the weirdest things I've ever reported on. Yeah. Did he say that the U.S. or some Western country exported genetically modified soldiers into his country? Yes, he referred to them as chemi chemical weapons. Toxic. Even. Toxic substances into his country. Nephilim. The Nephilim. That, that's what it would be. That's what we're dealing with. He's talking about Nephilim. The Nephilim are back. This isn't the only time he said that either. I mean, he's made that reference before. When did he say it? In 2016, the same ambassador, referring again to the jihadists, the ones that Saudi Arabia's put in, other people have been armed, he brought this up in regard to Aleppo. He said that genetically modified fighters are being used and exported into his country. We actually have that clip too. He said this at the United Nations. And this is 2016. 2016. All right, let's watch this one too. The Syrian government is still ready to evacuate remaining unlawful armed groups in the terrorist pockets in the eastern part of Aleppo. And it has organized yesterday a convoy to evacuate 3,750 terrorists and their families. Unfortunately, some member states and the Security Council and the mainstream media continue to defend and support the genetically modified armed Syrian opposition moderate, by definition, while turning a blind eye to the crimes committed by them. <laughs> Genetically modified soldiers in the Middle East. The jihadists, he's talking about ISIS. Yes. yes. He, re he called them genetically modified. I mean, this is, Doc, they're, they're Nephilim. Right. Now, in, in 2015, ISIS, uh, one of the most shocking uh, executions was when ISIS beheaded 21 Egyptian Christians. Coptic Christian men. Right. And I remember a lot of people talking about how tall these men were. Right. Because people were saying, hey, they're not, those aren't uh, Arabs. Uh, they're too tall. They, they, they look like American basketball players. We've got a video. I want to go ahead. We'll show it and we'll just keep talking. But this is what they were referring to that these men looked abnormally tall for being uh, Arab soldiers. Right. Clearly taller than their captives. Because you yes. look at the head. The head doesn't even come up to the shoulders on some of these, uh, these soldiers. I mean, you're talking about seven, seven and a half foot tall uh, terrorists here in this video. So now we're talking, think about this. Ha was the ISIS invasion, which came from, I mean, just, it just appeared, ISIS. It just appeared. Right. Nobody had ever heard of ISIS. And they're going through... Syrian and Iraqi towns cutting off people's heads and slaughtering people. Did America produce these creatures in laboratories? Did we grow these things and then turn them loose on the Christians in the Middle East? For dear God, how wicked and evil are we? In four months ago, President Putin talked, yes. he told students in Russia that that our, uh, nations were developing super soldiers right. that w would have no fear, would be uh, able to go through all kinds of pain. So this is not... A um, concept. It's not even outlandish. No, no. World leaders are openly talking about it. Folks, we, we've entered wow. the twilight zone. We've entered the last days. Jesus Christ is coming. You got to get ready, church. You got to get ready. Jesus Christ is coming. Don't be sitting there waiting on a secret rapture. Jesus Christ is coming. We've got to preach the gospel now. The Nephilim are back.